Comedians swear by a hallowed rule. It is called the rule of three. When you tell a joke with examples, you work in threes. The first two are normal or reasonable, and the third one is the punchline or the twist that's supposed to make you laugh. For example, I go to Las Vegas to see the shows, to dine at the great restaurants, and to pay respects to my money. <laughs> One, two, three. The rule of three goes beyond humor, though. There are three ghosts in Dickens' A Christmas Carol. There's three blind mice. There's three sets of three Star Wars sagas. I had to weave in Star Wars somehow this weekend. There's three branches of government. Our own Episcopal tradition is founded on a three-pronged Anglican system of trust in scripture, tradition, and reason. So good things come in threes, and three-pronged ideas give us the greatest perspective on our world. So we have the eternal example of threes that is our focus today, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you thought last Sunday was it for speaking in tongues, well, I've got news for you because it's Trinity Sunday. <laughs> You're bound to get confused somehow, and that's okay. It's normal. As we've laid track for three weeks now, the Holy Spirit is not a twist or a punchline, but a full-fledged member of the Trinity. The truth of how God operates as a Trinity is the focus today, and it's the stuff of really confusing theology. It usually leaves us all to just devolve into, I don't know, I give up. It's a mystery. How does God operate? That is the real question. I wonder if Nicodemus, the Jewish teacher and the Pharisee, in today's lessons from John, was searching for an answer to that same question. How does God work? The story is unique to John's gospel and recounts Nicodemus, a person of some stature from the governing body of Jewish leaders, and he has taken a liking to Jesus and Jesus' teachings. Early in John's gospel, we find Nicodemus here under the cover of night, and he's seeking a late-night Q&A session with Jesus. Note the contrast. He comes at night. He is literally in the dark about these things. And Jesus, by contrast, is the light of the world. Nicodemus is struggling to gain perspective and to understand the world and therefore understand God better. Two things happen of note in the conversation. Yes, Jesus explains to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, etc., etc. This is the first real proclamation of who he is in this book. John 3.16 might be the theological statement of the whole gospel. The other thing to note is that this curious exchange about being water and the Spirit leaves Nicodemus confused. The phrase, born again, might make us recoil a little bit, so it's better translated born anew. The metaphor is renewal in faith, especially through baptism and the nourishment of the Eucharist. It's something we often take for granted. But Nicodemus is a leader of the people, and he still, at the same time, has an innocence and a naivete and is not afraid to ask simple questions. So he's right to say, time out, I don't get it. We were born once, and then we die. How do we become born anew? And this teases out an analogy, explanation from Jesus. We are not born anew that way. We are born again in the spirit. And so the idea of flesh and blood and parentage is all turned on its ear. Baptism is God bringing about a rebirth for us. Nicodemus gets three mentions. Of course, it's three. Three mentions, only in John. The second appearance is much later at Jesus' trial. And at that point now, Nicodemus has the gall to defend Jesus by reminding the Sanhedrin that he needs to be heard before being convicted of a crime. 
And you get the sense that Nicodemus is secretly hoping Jesus will produce some kind of miracle or say something, and maybe say only what they need to hear in order to spare his life. But if that, of course, does not happen. You imagine Nicodemus just watching in horror and shaking his head, unable to do anything to protect Jesus. Finally, the third appearance of Nicodemus is the aftermath of the crucifixion, where he is a witness. There are so many portraits, so many pieces of art that show Nicodemus stepping up just way too late, helping the disciples and Mary to take the body down and lay it in the tomb. The gospel speaks of him helping to bring oils and myrrh to anoint the body in the aftermath. And it's basically a public outing of his friendship with Jesus, all in order to give Jesus a proper burial. This association with that bandit, Jesus of Nazareth, got Nicodemus in hot water. And we think from several Jewish accounts from the first century that he was estranged from the Sanhedrin for his friendship with Jesus. And we believe he was martyred later in that century in the early persecution of Christians. So the relationship with the Lord that begins with a bold and brave night visit in secrecy flowers into a real loving devotion for this unexpected leader of the Jews. Nicodemus is a reminder of a time where affiliating with Jesus Christ got you killed. But he is also a reminder of the childlike, inquisitive nature we are all called to draw upon when we try to wrap our heads around the mystery of God. He is emblematic of that search to know God more the search to gain a better understanding or perspective on our world. And the revelation he gets from Jesus paints a picture of a God who behaves in three distinct aspects. God the creator above and beyond. God the son, the Christ, the human flesh who dwells among us. And God the spirit, the sustaining force in the world, the love of God within the Trinity, then, is just a way to help us look at God and have a different perspective. God beyond, God among, God within. All God, but all three different behaviors all at once. All three different experiences of God all at once. And when you look at it through that prism, the Trinity has far less to do with theology and complicated doctrine, and a lot more to do with us. How do we experience God in our lives? We may never, and we ought never, to have all the knowledge of God and how God works. That's what Nicodemus tried to get in this reading from John, but he didn't really receive that either. Although perhaps by the time of the crucifixion, he was starting to get a clearer picture of God and God's love. The mystery of a triune God, a Trinitarian God, may be, however, a puzzle that reveals more about us and us on our journey of discovery, looking for perspective in our world. So on Friday, my family and I finally took the architectural river cruise downtown Chicago. And one building stuck out to me among so many beautiful buildings. But one building really kind of stuck with me. And it's the Swiss Hotel. It's on Wacker Street, designed by architect Harry Weiss. Harry Weiss was a student of postmodernism, which we learned on the cruise from a wonderful docent. Postmodernism was a reaction to the basic simplicity of modernist design, which had right angles and straight lines and boxes and squares. The Swiss Hotel is unlike many buildings in downtown because it is a triangle. That's right, three sides, not four. For Harry Weiss, let's hope and give him the benefit of the doubt that there was a Trinitarian idea going on there. <laughs> One side for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nah. But really his re re rationale was this, which he was quoted as saying. It has one of its points aiming towards the river, 
And now, as Harry Weiss said, two of the three facades have a clear view of the cityscape and the river instead of just one facade. So in its three-sided design, Weiss's building allows more and more people to gain a better perspective on the world around them. On this Trinity Sunday and this Memorial Day weekend, may we all gain a better perspective on the mystery of God, and may we pray to know God more through a better view. Amen.